um, Dan Polsky that was in 2005 in circulation that uses difference and differences and talking about it in some detail. So uh, go ahead and read it. I put it up on the Blackboard site. And for those of you playing along uh, with a copy of the slides, I just posted a new version. Don't worry, they're only different. I added one slide. It's relatively minor. Uh, so if uh, you're worried that I switched all the content on you, uh, it's not even first or anything. I wouldn't do that. Uh, all right. So uh, let's first start talking about propensity scores. The intuition behind the propensity scores is that you know, we're still trying to measure causal effects, um, but that you know, unlike regression, where there may be this problem of extrapolation across cells, where there's not good balance, the propensity score is an explicit way to try to address this balance issue, to try to make the sample more balanced. That is, after we do the propensity score approach, we expect that individual <coughs> subjects in our study with the same propensity score level should have um, the same covariate values independent of their treatment status. So basically, the, the, the basic intuition about the propensity scores that we're going to take all the potential x's that we can find and summarize them in a single measure, which is that measure is going to be the probability of receiving treatment. So like regression analysis, propensity scores only control for observable characteristics. And so our uh, conditional independence assumption will hold because uh, if it holds for a vector of x covariance, then it also will hold for the expected value of this function, the expected value of getting the treatment, which I've been using d for, following neighbors and Pischke, probability of you know, the mean of d conditional on getting that x. So if we're summarizing this information, we may have information on lots of different x's, but we're going to compact it down into a single measure. Because of this, though, in most cases, and nearly in all cases at this point, propensity scores are used in, this, in a context where we have a binary treatment choice. There has been some work to expand this to kind of multi-arm treatments, but uh, to my knowledge, and I'm not a, a propensity score expert, or an expert really much, but um, particularly propensity scores, I have not seen anybody use propensity scores in the context of a continuous <laughs> treatment type variable or, or policy variable. So it's not something to, to keep in mind. Um, but you know, in a lot of cases, we can turn things into binary uh, treatment uh, settings, even when we have continuous by truncating or collapsing or whatever. So uh, the process, let me go through the process of creating a, a propensity or of doing a propensity score analysis. Um, in the beginning, <clears throat> we estimate a regression of the probability of receiving a treatment, again, that we're using D to denote that, as a function of the observed covariance. Um, because our goal is going to be prediction in the second step, we usually use logistic regression, and because statisticians and biostatisticians and epidemiologists get cranky about linear probability models, we use them just, this is a technique that came out of the statistics, most of the statistics <coughs> literature. Um, so we use logistic regression. One important thing is that we don't care about multicollinearity here. Our goal here is not to measure the causal impact of some, you know, some uh, variable in the vector x, or some variable or some variable, um, on whether or not you get treatment. We're here to try to load up, this is a purely a, a mechanical operation, we're trying to load up this logistic regression as much as possible to get balance. Because we're explicitly excluding um, the treatment variable from this x vector. That is, we're trying to, we're modeling just, did you get the treatment as a function of everything else that we are trying to control for? Patient demographics, you know, um, clinical characteristics, whatever it is, all that stuff is going into that, into that regression. It can be interactive. We can include higher terms. Um, and then you know, we're going to take that predicted probability in the second step, calculate the predicted probability, which I'll show you how to do, which is actually really easy. That predicted probability is the propensity score. Um, and as with <laughs> regression, if a particular covariate x is not predictive of um, getting the treatment, then it doesn't matter for in terms of estimating the treatment effect either. So we, that's, the first two steps are straightforward and, and are common. We figure out what observable data we have, what observable characteristics we're modeling. We model logistic regression of whether I got the treatment as a function of all those characteristics. Then we pop out the predicted probability. So each person then gets a value that, you know, ranging from 0 to 1 of the probability based on their covariate profile of whether or not they're likely to get the 
um, probably they ought to get the treatment. But then the, there's the, the art of this is how to use the propensity score once you uh, measure it. So there are a few different approaches, and I'll go through each of them with some kind of overview, I guess. So first is matching with final certification. We can also use regression with or without matching and certification. And there's also a, a whole vein of research now uh, figuring out how to weight the sample in a weighted regression context based on the propensity score. So how do we actually do it? Here's some state of code. Um, first three lines are just setting up a set of independent variables. That's our x vectors, all the things we want to control for. So our usual, our usual suspects are in here for now. Race, payer, diagnosis category, uh, comorbidity count. Though I have it in there twice. Notice that's a little bogus error, but this data will kick it out automatically. Um, and some other crap that uh, may or may not, I'm not sure why I have academic here and there, primary PCI, I have a bunch of extra variables. Simply then we just estimate a logistic model, logit, dependent variable is DES, that's whether or not you got drug eluting stents in this case, as a function of all this stuff. And I'm using this local macro syntax here, because in case I want to use it again later, it's easier for me to, to figure out what these independent variables are once, and then every time I want to reference them, I just use that funny left quote, and then the regular end, uh, single quote, to, that's the name. Indep bars is the name of this local macro, and it says, okay, whenever I see indep bars, substitute in all of my, um, all of my x, all of my you know, covariates that I have, whatever I have in there, substitute in. Then to get the predicted probability, all I have to do is ask data to say predict some variable name, which I just call PS for the propensity score, comma PR. The comma PR tells data that we want, after the logistic question, we want the predicted probability. There are other things we can ask for. There are actually a whole bunch of things we could ask for, and it depends on what kind of regression you ran before the predicted probability as to what sort of things you can ask data for. And in fact, if I had just left out the comma PR, it would have given me the predicted probability anyway, because that's the default behavior, but I'd rather not have you assume that that's what's going to give you and be specific about it. Comma PR says, okay, I got the predicted probability. I want to take a look at this. And there are two a variety of ways you can do this. Here are two easy ways to um, take a look at the distribution of the predicted probability from this model. So first off, I want to do by what, what kind of treatment you got, a histogram. I could have wrote out a histogram, but I was lazy. Histogram uh, PS. Or there's another um, uh, command which you need to download some extra software from, uh, and I have some links, or not links, but some names of um, some other user-written programs that are specific to progressive score analysis. So I say p-score, and then it takes the, the options, the treated variable is DES, that is the treatment variable, whether they got DES, DES equals one, if they got the treatment or not, and the propensity score variable name in parentheses is just PS. Why do you use the, the command um, log it instead of regress? <coughs> um, so I want log it here because I want a logistic regression. If I had just oh, said logistic. regress, yeah. um, it would have given me a linear probability model or ordinary least squares oh, okay. regression. So I basically I'm, I'm asking for, I could have done logistic, it's the same thing as log it. As I showed you uh, Tuesday, it just, um, distinguishes between whether or not you get the odds ratios or the coefficients out of the regression. So this is the histogram uh, version. So on the left panel, we have DES equals uh, zero. On the right panel, DES equals one. So this, this is the, the histogram of the distribution of the propensity score. So not surprisingly, we suspect that people who actually got the propensity score were, on average, more likely to get the propensity score. That's not surprising, and that's OK. What we want, though, is to we want to basically compare people who have the same propensity score. And for people who are for our subjects for whom they're not matches, we're going to want to exclude them. So if there's someone, like if you have a down here, and let's say this is like, you know, 0.2 predicted probability of getting a, a drug eluting stent, right? There are not a lot of people down, there are not many people south of 50% in this case. So, they're not good matches. Remember, we're stratifying for, we're, we're holding constant your propensity score, just like we hold constant the x variables that go into the propensity score, to make these comparisons. We want to compare in the counterfactual, you who had, you know, an 80% chance of getting a drug eluting stent, 
and got a drug eluting stent to somebody who also had an 80% of getting a drug eluting stent, but didn't. That's the fundamental characteristic, and that is why the P-score um, graphic, which is um, awfully convenient, lines things up, it's the same information, but now on top we have, did you get the drug eluting stent? Yes. Did you not get the drug eluting stent? No. The same um, histograms, although they're wider, wider columns, so they're less fine detail. But you can see basically <clears throat> down here there are there are some slim red lines. I mean there are there are people that go all the way down here, but you might think you know um, there may be some people working about who don't like right down here. There's a red line. There's actually it doesn't look there's anyone in the blue category to compare. So we need we need to be able to say like okay. For people, and then we want to compare them to people down here, roughly speaking. So how do we do that? What are those techniques that we might actually use the Prensic Score to accomplish this lining up of people with a Prensic Score of 0.8 who got the treatment, and people with a Prensic Score of 0.8 who didn't get the treatment? So in terms of this, like this basically says that your model is okay, but not, is, is like what you'd want to see ideally is basically if the lower graph was all the way towards zero and then the top graph was all the way to the one, then oh, that would be your model is really, really good or really, really um, Well, so what we want from a propensity score perspective is we want balance. We want, it doesn't matter so much that, what well, the worst case would be like, let's say the red bars were all stacked at one and the blue bars were all stacked at zero. Uh -huh. That's going to be a problem because we need we need these cases where we have lining up, where we have people with the same propensity score, who, who did get DES, who didn't get DES. If we have separation, we've got a problem because we're not, there's no way to line up people because there, there's no counterfactual. These people represent the counterfactual, or these people down here represent the counterfactual for these people up here. This doesn't say anything about how good the uh, logistic model is in, in something like, you know, sort of generic sense, but that's okay. We don't care about the generic sense. We care, like, we're here aiming to try to come up with a good propensity score model. And that, you know, that's all, that's all we care about. Why though, in what sorts of situations is this used? Because it seems like if someone's more likely to get a drug eluting sense, they should want to get it than people who are, unless it's a randomized treatment. No, that's right, but we want to compare them to people who had a similar probability of getting it, but didn't actually get it. So the people who had, who were like, let's say this is like drug loose sense of function of age, right? Simply, right? So if you're over 65, you're damn likely to get the drug loose stent. We want to compare you to other people who are over 65, but didn't get the drug loose stent. Well, rather than just use a single, say, age as a determinant, there may be a bunch of things we want to match people on. Instead of matching them all, kind of matching age and sex and race and clinical characteristics kind of manually, which is a legitimate way, and there are, I'll show you, they're not, I won't show you, but we talked about matching last week. There are programs that will do it for you. This says, let me condense all that information into a single unidimensional metric, the propensity score. How likely were you to get drug link stents? And then let me compare you to people who were like you in terms of that probability but did or did not. So it seems like in general, the more variables you add, the harder it is to get a propensity score. Because as you're matching more closely, then you're getting more to, if they really should have gotten both instead, they would get the same. But, but, so if there's perfection in the prediction, like if, um, I mean, sorry, if there's, if there's separation, like I was saying before, if there's separation, like if there's some characteristic where, if you're over 65, you get the stent. If you're under 65, you don't get the stent. Then you're going to have a problem because it's impossible to compare people who are over 65 who got the stent to people who are over 65 and didn't get the stent. You'd have no stent. You know, the stent you'd, have, you'd have separation, which I was talking about. Like the point, the, the distributions would be one would be at one, one would be at zero, and they wouldn't overlap at all. Which is, but this is a useful. This tells you something about how where your sample overlaps and sort of under sort of where the probability range. It looks like given our data, drug eluting stents are more frequently used than not, which is consistent with you know just a simple with a simple uh, tab of DES use, so that's that's okay. But um, you know like the, the fatty parts are right around here in that 80% range. So are you using I'm just like a little confused what 
what the uses are you using propensity score to look at the sample or are you using it to select out from a larger sample what you want your sample to be? We haven't gotten to that, but we're about That's to get that. So so far I'm just setting up the how do we how do you compute and what are you looking at? So this is like on the path to using the drug uh, the drug instead, to using the propensity score. We got to generate it. Right. And then we want to look at what we want to look at it. And if there's no overlap, we're in trouble. But if there's overlap here, so we want to like I'm just talking to like I'll start going into some specificity about methods for using this information to make to make comparisons. Okay. Is that yeah. So this, okay. this graph sort of just makes sense to me in the sense that the people on the the people who have very low propensity to get a TES like mostly didn't. That's on the left side of the graph, right? Like all those little purple bars that go down. Right. Yes. Okay. So if you had less than fifty percent, like like most of the people just didn't if they were like. Yeah. And whatever. But the people on the right side, if they, if they, if they, you have a fair number of people who did end and who both had, who all, who had pretty high likelihood of getting one. Right. So you want to go for those. Okay. We, right. So it's part of it is like it, it's not just like oh look we have good numbers. It's in a literal sense like is there anybody to compare with? And, right. So if there's nobody to compare with. We've got problems. But then if you recall from what we were talking about. Um, on Tuesday with the matching, like in situations where you have the best balance within a covariate is where regression, for example, weights that comparison most heavily. So if they're equal, in, in cells, say, or let's say we were doing regression, and we'll talk about how we would do that, we were using, just generically, using regression in cells or, or strata of uh, propensity scores where there's about <coughs> equal users and non-users, or treatment and control, those are going to be the places where we're going to have the most, or regression at least, would weight that comparison most, that comparison and outcomes, conditional on drug eluding stent use, most heavily. We've got a situation with one, let's say like one drug eluding stent user and a thousand non-users, that comparison is going to be weighted less heavily because the variance of that is, is smaller. Something I talked about a little on Tuesday. If that doesn't make any sense, that's okay. Well, um, well, I'll keep going anyway. Um, <laughs> and we'll try again later. Um, <clears throat> so the first approach is, is matching. And the, the algorithm here is, is pretty straightforward. Divide subjects into groups uh, with a similar likelihood of receiving the treatment regardless of whether they actually did. And, and then compare their outcomes uh, by whether or not they got the um, treatment conditional on their uh, probability of actually getting it. Uh, matching is most commonly used in cases where we've got uh, relatively small, so this may be the distribution, this may be about the sample size, where we have like, let's say we want like, uh, you've only got 10, you know, not 10, but some small number of treatment, of treatment group, and maybe a much larger set of individuals who didn't, who are potentially in the control. You want to find the people in the control who best match the people, the subjects in your treatment group. And this can happen in cases like, I was doing an analysis um, looking at minimally invasive procedure use and claims data and comparing it to the analog of the, the, the analogous uh, standard surgical treatment for the same condition, like um, min uh, minimally invasive prostatectomy versus open prostatectomy or something like that. Right? So depending on what year we might be looking at, there might not be very many cases who have who actually got the treatment or because we were using commercial claims. Maybe there's a condition that's relatively rare. So we only have, over 10 years ago, we only got 100 treatment cases, and we've got you know, 10,000 open prostatectomies. Um, we want to make sure that our 100 treatments are matched with the best possible, most closest, most closest, the closest 100 among that 10,000 who didn't get the treatment. Um, so how do we actually do matching? And, and, and I'll walk you through the algorithm letting you know up front that there's plenty of specialized software that you can get access to in Stata that will do this all for you. It's becoming highly automated and there's like sort of the, there's been a big, uh, not explosion, this growth in sort of the variety of techniques. And like, oh, do you want to do it this way, that way, or some other way? So I'm, I'm going through a kind of a basic approach and I'll direct you to some of the software that you want to get more um, specific about actually doing it, but at least, you know, hopefully at the end of today you'll have a, a good conceptual basis for making some decision about which way you might want to go or which ways you could go at least. So the, the matching algorithm is simply, first off, let's randomly order the treatment subjects 
And then one by one, we're going to take, okay, so change the subject one, what's your propensity score? 0. 0.8, okay? Let's go find all those control subjects within, you know, with a propensity score within a pre-specified distance of 0. 0.8. So what does the distance actually mean? There's actually a variety of different metrics used for different for distance, but you can think just simply of an arithmetic one of like, okay, everybody within 0.7 to 0. Or 0. 0.79 to 0.81, depending on how thick your and how how thick and how big your uh, sample is. Um, and then you want to decide, okay, so I'll take those matches, whatever constitutes a match in terms of distance. Maybe it's the closest person or subject in the control group. Maybe it's all the five closest. Maybe it's everybody. Um, and then take that aside, put them in a data set, call them a match, go to the next treatment control uh, treatment subject in your order. They have a, a propensity score of 0.6. Go find their matches. And so and so on until you iterate through until there are no control subjects, no treatment subjects left, and no control subjects left where there's a good match. So you can exhaust your um, you can exhaust your one or the other. The point there, I think, simply is that that's okay. We want matches. We're going for the, we're going for accuracy in terms of or proximity in terms of matches, and leaving especially throwing out information about people who don't match well, either treatments that don't match well to controls or controls that don't match well to treatments. We're, we're we're getting homogeneity, but we're potentially losing information. We're certainly shrinking down our sample size. Hmm. Not certainly, but I should say potentially shrinking down sample size. So, propensity score matching is nice because it's a lot easier than matching on all observable covariates. Although, again, there is software that will do that for you. Um, but it's certainly easier to think that um, you're more likely to get a good match on a propensity score than you are to get a good match on a vector of 100 uh, covariates. Um, and <clears throat> once you have match data, the analysis can be really straightforward. You can do simple. It's like, it's like basically like a randomized control trial without the actual randomization. You got a treatment, you got a control. You can do simple bivariate statistics, comparing t-tests, lining them up with each other, or whatever uh, bivariate statistics you want to. Um, or you can make it more complicated. And again, as I just said, note that there'll be some shrinkage of the sample, probably, because it'll be throwing out the bad, the, the observations on either side that don't match well. So, you know, that, just to go back here, like, yeah, it's not obvious that you won't get any matches, but like there's only going to, for every red one red guy, there's only going to be an equal number, or maybe he'll do one to five or whatever, like depending on how you're, you choose it. Let's say you're doing a one to one match, you'll be throwing out sort of all this stuff where there's not an equal size. So like maybe throwing out treatments up here because there aren't enough controls to match them. And so you'll get sort of like this minimum distance. If you took a, you'd have a symmetric, Symmetric plot of the, the final sample. I should have done it actually. It'd be kind of cool. Symmetric plot where the, sym the symmetry is within bucket of of uh, So like, so like just for like, so down here where you drop all those ones like down at like zero point two because there's no treated. Well, so I don't like I only take if there's let's say there's one guy in this group in the treatment group, but I take one guy in the control group and I throw out all the other guys. Okay. And you know, and so on and so on and so on. And so like that's my like my sim the symmetry like you're you're doing a haircut on either side to make sure that there's only to make sure like mirror. Right. In, in terms of distance from the from the zero line. Um, that, that's one way to do that's I mean again, there's a lot of variations of potential <coughs> matching algorithms or a lot of there are a lot of different matching algorithms you can do. Um, I don't have strong priors on the best way or I don't I think a lot of this research is still ongoing as to how to do it, but Matching is certainly, um, as a general approach, something that's been showing up a lot in, well, Francis was a gentleman showing up a lot in the literature increasingly since even the TV 2000. Um, and matching is certainly one um, piece of that. I'm sorry, sorry. All right, so, oh, sorry, Tori. Uh, why, do you, why do you do it randomly? Like, when you, like, why don't you just go from, like look at all uh, yeah, I mean, propensity scores. And you know, so I think randomly, randomly is, is just basically like, well, why not do it randomly? Like, what's the harm in doing it randomly? Whereas you may be introducing some bias if you're, like, I don't know, like you're gonna selectively, you know, if you start from the top and go down, you'll, you'll like, these aren't perfect matches, right? These are buckets, but you may be winding up with a sample that's relatively skewed forward because you're starting from one side, and so you're more likely, you're less likely to get a match 
at the back end because he will have used up um, he will use up good matches for higher values. Is that a problem? I don't know, but it seems like well, you know, randomization has this nice feature in the general context of kind of protecting yourself from yourself. Uh, it's true with the randomized control trial, and I think it's just like well, why not do randomization here? There may be stronger reasons than that, but that's my intuitive guess, guess explanation. Well, if you go one direction, then you are introducing a definitive bias if your data looks like this, right? Because then you're, like, if you take all the, say, like, the analogy is the top are the cases and the bottoms are the controls, and you're basically trying to match all the cases with controls, and you start from one direction, you're going to, like you said, you're going to use a Right. Well, yeah, it depends. It may depend on sort of the. I think it's depend on the actual empirical distribution of your data and the specifics of your matching algorithm as to whether you, what your calipers are, like sort of how far and wonder how far you want to go and whether there's anything there. But certainly, it admits the possibility that you'd bias your sample. You'd be favoring match. You'd be more. Like, you'll match earlier on higher values or lower values. But you so, can only match with the people below the line. Right, but it, but it's the best. It may be the best match within a certain criteria, right? So let's say we take everybody within 0 0.1, 0 0.01 probability, right? So the best match is 0 0.0001, but I'm, you know, so and that's that guy gets that. But there's a lot of clumping, and so we'll start kind of picking observations farther, relatively farther away. And so maybe by the time we get here, we're not. We've, I'm making it up, and obviously making little hand puppets, but. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> This is all by way of saying I think you're, you're introducing potential bias okay. in the in the um, selection process. So do you do, so how does this compare to something like minimization? Is this like it just an easier technique than than that, or like you wouldn't really use? Minimization? What's that, what do you mean by minimization? So like if you have like a bunch of different characteristics you're looking through, and you kind of just like dip in um, and pick the one that's most likely, and then I guess that's more for randomized control trial, I guess. And then well, just like redo it again. And like like iteratively? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just easier to do it, or it, like which one would be more accurate if you just kind of like. I'm not sure it. I totally get the minimization that you're talking about. I mean, it. Uh, yeah, where it's a, sort of more like a dynamic allocation where you're picking the best and then going back in. Oh, back so in. I, yeah. yeah, that goes in like this is all under the rubric of what's your matching algorithm, right? Yeah. Like, so like, and. The one that I presented was totally was a basic version, but there are like I don't have strong I don't have strong I can't give you strong intuition about whether like sort of randomizing the order that you're doing it, what the best metric is to use, whether like how many to match, whether like, you're you just I mean I, I guess like, the, the the match is gonna be there are all kinds of matching algorithms out there, right? About like minimum how far away do you want to go, how many people do you want, what's best. Um, I would look further in the software about that, or I can look around. I mean, I'm not sure okay. think more about it, yeah. or we can consult with somebody who's, I think, on more of a biostatics, but more of a propensity score <laughs> guru. I mean, I, I would, my, you know, this is the typical sort of non-specialist, like, well, since I don't know that much about it, it can't really be that important, right? So it's a matching algorithm, and you know, A is just as good as B, as far as I can tell. And that may be true. You know, the, the empirical version is we'll try them both and see what happens. Um, and that, that, like, well, if they're the same, then you're, in, then it doesn't matter. You're in good shape. If they're different, then why did you ask that question that you didn't want to know the answer to? Like, what do you do about it? I, I don't. And that's the joy of empiricism, especially when you start doing, introducing like randomization into this. Everything's gonna be keyed off the seed if you do it enough times and bootstrap it. I, I don't know, like that. I Maybe mean, like we're down the path that's like mm -hmm. beyond, I think, useful or first stage when we work to it. I don't know if this is too specific, but let's say I'm merging two data sets. Could I do this like a nurse and a patient data set? For example. For example. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk I about really extensive. <laughs> 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 Um, I know we're just starting to use these measures in our center, and I think what we do is we develop this for the patient first, and then we merge that with the nurse. So we develop a propensity score for the patient, and then we merge it with the nurse data. It, so this com the propensity score comes in as like one of our covariates. Oh, wait, 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 so we're not there yet. Okay. Okay, we'll get to that. But so what's your what's your treatment that you're 
But the propensity is four. Um, well, I believe that we're looking at this for magnet and non-magnet status that we're developing it. So the treatment is like magnet credential hospital. And that's like- So, okay, so the treatment is, were you admitted to a magnet hospital mm -hmm. or not based on patient characteristics? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, so that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, so that sounds good. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the question. I'm not sure if the question was, or that you were just eliminating a possible application. And I'll talk about regression adjustment for for my scores in my mind. I think I'm converting. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Was a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Just a quick question. Um, so how do you? So clearly you can match on all absorbable characteristics. I mean, as but how do you choose like? Let's say you took race out of the propensity score, or of the creation of the propensity score. Like, will that change your distribution? It potentially could. And do you, how do you sort that? Do you just keep on trying? Like, well, I, I'm, like, I'm not sure. Like, we like, well, I'll try. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> Same thing should be a regression model, right? Like, <laughs> pull race in, pull race out. What happens? <laughs> put sex in, put sex out. What happens? It's like. You know, the hokey pokey, right? I mean. yeah, but, but the point is, like, I have a conceptual model of who gets a drug eluding stent, right? And then I have patient factors like age, sex, blah, 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 that predict whether you're going to get a drug eluding stent or not. And then I have physician factors, blah, blah, blah. How do you decide what to put in a propensity store and how do you decide what to leave out that you're going to actually analyze yeah. and look at? Wow. So what are you saying that there are like, are you interested in the causal association? So this is all predicated on, let's back up a little bit. Oh, I can't find the last week. <laughs> this is all predicated on the idea that you are, so all I was talking about was a, a simple situation, right? We've got an outcome, we've got a treatment, we've got a bunch of control variables that we're not interested in their specific associations with the outcome, okay? so. We can calculate the propensity score as a probability of getting treatment as a function of all the crap that we don't care about, but is important in a bi potentially bias-inducing sense. Generate the propensity score, and now we replace all of these x's with the propensity score, and we can match the propensity score. We can do some other stuff I'll talk about in a second. If you're interested in the causal association between multiple variables and um, an outcome, you probably want to put those in the regression in a regression model context, right? I mean, we don't, and it turns out, and I'll show you. Maybe we'll, I'll, if I keep talking, some of this concern will go away. I think, but you can use propensity scores and regression together, like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, they, yeah. yeah anyway. um, so you're going to take propensity score here that you created, plus whether they got the drug eluding stent to look at outcomes. That's the whole right, thing. Right, right, right. But I was looking at the causal effect of getting a drug to step on outcomes, controlling for all the crap that leads to all the balancing crap. Right. Um, well, we can, we can, I mean, that, that may be, that's very randomized control trial, and we may want to get more specific to that. Yeah. So you do have a variable that you think affects the treatment does, but then also affects the outcome. Do you then not want to use propensity score? If you put it into the propensity score, then the effect of that variable on the outcome in your regression. Is that right? Putting in the propensity score and controlling for it, yes. I, I'm, I'm, this is good. I'm trying to communicate yeah. this idea that putting in the propensity score and controlling for it are, this, are, are analogous operations. Mm -hmm. yeah. The question is whether or not you want to be able to say what is the association between X and Y controlling for other stuff. If you put in the propensity score, it gets subsumed into this right. summary measure. Yeah. But if you want to know, like, the, oh, I also want to know the effective race on outcomes controlling for this other stuff, putting in the Renzi score is going to, well, and leaving the Renzi score is going to be problematic. But I'll show you something in a second that may dissuade some of your concerns or give you some more flexibility about how to use the Renzi score. So far, we just said matching, right? Matching is just very control, or RCT ish. Find the best control, look at the difference in outcomes for you and your control. Average that across, and you've got a measure of the treatment effect of the treatment, right? And that's RCT we work. We don't care what the association is between all the stuff we're controlling for and the outcome. We're just putting it in regression because we have it, and because we want to make sure that our treatment and control are as similar as possible, except for the fact that they got one got the drug instead and one didn't. 
or the magnet. Okay, and we're good, good so far. Uh, so matching is one approach. A similar approach is stratification. So here, basically, you can think about stratification as like a really coarse matching in some sense. Um, it's easier. So we can take the same information and basically say we split the, the sample up into quintiles of propensity score. It doesn't have to be quintiles, it could be deciles, it could be quartiles. You don't, even tertiles, I think people use. Probably median's a little too rough. But basically we're saying, to go back to our graph, um, let's take, so these are, I mean, let's take like quintile one, quintile two, quintile three, quintile four, and quintile five are all locked together. And we're just going to compare treatment and control conditional on quintile propensity score rather than on precise propensity score. Is this as good? Well, it's not as precise, but you're also throwing out less information in terms of the control. And if you're really worried about sort of the broad brush issues of like really likely to get propensity score or get G drug and drug set versus really unlikely, you're still getting that level of, of control for um, for the the uh, the, the x vector of control variance. Um, <coughs> so you can do that and, and compute within quintile differences in the uh, within quintile differences in outcomes conditional on whether or not you've got treatment versus control. So quintile one was the effect of DES on length and stay. Quintile two, quintile three. You can also do a weighted average across quintiles of that um, of that effect. And you still get some of this balance issue. Like if you've got quintiles where there are treatments <laughs> but no controls, that quintile is going to fall out, right? Because there are no controls. And even if there are only one or two controls and a lot of treatments, you can still see that. And when you do the weighted averaging, you account for that, uh, that fact as well. Um, <coughs> the other thing that's nice about quintiles, potentially, is that you can look at the effect across quintiles and see whether it's um, whether it's the same or different. And depending on your context, there might be information in that to say like, you know, the effect of getting a drug loose stent appears to be a lot different among those people who are almost 100% likely of getting it than it does among people who are more, say, borderline 50-50% of likely to get it. And so there may be some, from your conceptual model slash context slash institutional details, there may be something about that association that is interesting. Like, oh look, you know, there's that, there's that, effectively we're looking at heterogeneous treatment effects. So we're not constraining the effect to be the same across everybody, we could look at that. And it's heterogeneous across quintile of propensity, which, you know, again, maybe, uh, maybe interesting. One thing you need to do with uh, propensity scores, regardless, I think, of the approach that you use, but particularly for stratification, is you want to check the covariate balance. So this is an empirical exercise. We're saying, a uh, dual logistic model of drug and stent on a function of a bunch of covariates. <coughs> and then we'll have a balance, right? But you can go back and look and say, okay, within a quintile, there should be no significant difference among the x's that you have in the propensity score between you know, the mean of age conditional on getting drug and stent and the mean of age not getting drug and stent conditional on quintile five. That's an empirical question. So it may be that your propensity score which is taking information from all your axes and summarizing it into a single propensity score, may balance most, but not all, of your covariates. That's OK. You can address this simply by also putting this in a regression model, which I'll show you in a second, and controlling for those covariates that don't balance. So you're kind of like saying, OK, I want to control for everything efficiently, but even if it doesn't work, I'm still going to control for those selected covariates that are still unbalanced, or I can tweak propensity score formulation. Hmm and try to go back and retest whether these things are balanced well. So, you know, we don't care about multicollinearity. We can throw in interactions with unbalanced propensity, uh, covariates and balanced, propensity, uh, balanced covariates. We can throw in higher order terms, especially that one that makes sense for non, you know, for continuous covariates, right? Like we don't need to square and cube and take to the fourth power of the W variable because that's not going to be very interesting. Also, we have collinear, so it's going to fall out. But if you've got like age and you're not balancing age, throw in age and age squared. Maybe even age cubed. Interacted with sex and race. I don't care. It doesn't matter. If you've got like, and if stuff falls out of the regression because they're collinear, we don't care. We're trying to get balance. That's all we care about is balance. It's not some like all the sort of usual rules about oh you don't have enough sample or whatever like. Those are going to be pr 
pragmatic concerns, because you can only fit as good a propensity score as you can, given the data that you have. But we're not here talking about, oh, you're violating the assumptions, or there's multicollinearity in particular that's going to mess up your estimates. We don't care about the associations in particular between the covariates and the outcomes. I mean, and the probability of getting treatment, right? We just care that they're balanced after we get this propensity score. So stratification is another way to do things. Oh, yeah, so uh, that process of checking balance, are you saying that that's really only necessary to do stratification but not, not for matching, or you would do it either way? I, I would, um, I mean, it's particularly an issue in the context, I mean, you can do it, so in, in quintiles, you can do it by quintile. Overall, you can do it once you kind of, um, well, I guess once you match, if you're doing matching, you want to do the same thing and check whether or not the covariate balance, the covariate balance. So you, you have your matched sample, of treatments and control with the same propensity score, match propensity scores, then you want to line them up and say, okay, among this match sample, drug loading set, mean of covariates, uh, didn't get drug loading, red metal set, mean of covariates, test for each covariate, whether or not the means are the same uh, across, and that would be reassuring. And if not, then you'd want to go back and tweak your model or do some more stuff, maybe control or whatever. Yeah. So one advantage to, well, the biggest advantage to doing this is it that you're basically summing all these like multiple variables into one measure, so you're kind of kicking out some of the noise that they would introduce if you include them all of them in your model, regression model. Oh. Um, that the, kind of one benefit to doing this? The noise is primarily an issue when you have small samples. So if you've got lots of things to control for in small samples, then um, the noise become like then it's you'll get unstable estimates. If you've got 100 treatments and, and you know, if you've got 100 treated cases, you've got 40 covariates you want to control for, that's going to be a problem. Even if, you, let's say, you've got a matched sample, you know, you've got 200 observations of 40 covariates, you're not getting a lot of information per, you, you know, the rule of thumb, I think, is like 10 observations per covariate or something. I mean, I think those are kind of bonus made up. But the reality is that if you have more Xs than you have sample, you can't estimate the model because there's literally not enough information. So the summarization is like, yes, we're summarizing the present score. If you've got a million observations, 40 covariates or 100 covariates, it doesn't really matter. But if, if you get closer to those smaller, like more, again, more kind of like RCT-ish, that's when things really start to, the, the, what your control control doesn't matter. So doing this doesn't get you around the fact that if you've thrown in 10 variables into your propensity score, you still need 10 times 10, like same. No, no, so this is where we're getting, this is where we're, we're cheating a little bit. We're cheating, the, we're cheating the man here. We're saying we've only got 100, we've only got 100 observations to form our propensity score. And those observations, like, and so that logit model from the propensity score may be kind of crappy in some ways. But that propensity, if, if we can get balance out of it, out of that propensity score model, then we can take that measure, that single measure, and use it to do stuff. We can either match on it, or we can, and I'll show you in a second, we can do regression conditional controlling for the propensity score, which I'm telling you in my slides. So let me, let me go, and those are some of the questions on, some other questions, I'll move forward, we can get to the, okay. Um, so let me, but before we get to that, let me show you what I want to talk about, which is the quintile example. Um, so we're still, on, we're still on stratification here. Here's some state of code. Um, again, we're, so we're, again, we're, we're running the logistic regression to generate, to do the model. We ask for the predicted probability to get the propensity score based on the results of the logistic model. Then we use this command xtile, which is a nifty little command. It does a couple of things, but one of the things that we're going to want it to do here is we're going to ask it to tell us to chop up our sample into quintiles based on the propensity score. So we say x style, we create a new variable called ps underscore quin. It's a function of the propensity score, ps. And we say nq, that's number of quantiles. We want five quantiles. So now we get a new variable, ps quin, which says one, two, three, four, five in it, which tells us how many, or tells us which quintile an observation is in based on its propensity score. Um, we could do quartiles, I'll change that to four, or deciles, I'll change that to 10. Um, or any number you want, and it'll do it for you. 
we want to create, uh, do a little housekeeping here, create two new variables. Basically, I'm using length of stay as an outcome. So I want to, I want to create a variable that's length of stay conditional on for those people that got DES, and length of stay only for those people who got bare metal stands, right? This is for housekeeping because I'm going to generate, I want to look at the distribution. So I'm going to run this table command. What does table command do? It has a bunch of stuff up here. What it gives me is by quintile, so that's table PS quid by quintile. The contents of the table are going to be first frequency, so sample size within that quintile. Damn near pretty close to each other, reassuring. Um, the uh, N of, for, for those who have a non missing value for a length of stay conditional on DES, that is the sample size for those people who got DES, 81,000 here, same thing for bare metal stents, 60,000 here, and then their mean conditional on a non missing value, which is why I did this stuff up here. So if you've got a, a drug eluding stent and you're in the lowest quintile, the lowest quintile, sorry, of uh, propensity score, you want to like to stay about four. Uh, compare that to if you've got bare metal stent in that lowest quintile, you'll like to stay about 4.2. You know, the difference is about about 0.3 days of stay, right? And you can look at this basically comparing this mean quintile by quintile tells you what the you know the it's our estimate of the treatment effect of getting a drug eluding stent. In the lowest quintile, it's 0.3 days. You know, it goes up to like 0.6 days. So it's a little bit variable, but it, you know, you can you can actually just measure that thing right there if you want to. Uh, let me zoom you what if you're doing quintiles. So now to the more the, the way I use propensity scores scores the most when I use them <coughs> is it's still in the regression context. Not again, this is not a judgment value. This is what I'm. Right. Sorry, so okay, can you sorry. check if they're balanced, or are you going to get to that? Oh, I didn't actually do the balance check. Okay. Here. So I'm not telling you go do it. I don't. I didn't show you anything there about how to do it. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. it's. I, it, there's probably some code to do it. Yeah, there's some code to do it. I can. I can okay. up someone and show you next time. Or okay, more. but it's something you don't um, have to worry. All right. So we did the quintile example. So now regression. Um, <coughs> We can, instead of matching or stratifying, we can actually just use the Prezi score as a covariate in and of itself. Remember, the Prezi score is a summarization of all the x variables that we put into the propensity score. So a simple specification here is going to be the outcome is a function of treatment and intercept and your actual linear continuous uh, propensity score. We're implicitly imposing the linear association here. So that propensity score is, you know, is linear in outcome. Is that completely accurate? You know, it's arbitrary. We could we could do some transformation to that, or I'll show you the next page. We could split it up into quintiles or something nonlinear. We we can transform this however we want to. The point is we're controlling for this summary of all the x variables. What's the best way to control for it? You know, there's no, it's like any kind of empirical variable oper operationalization issue. It's kind of up to you to figure that out. It may not make much of a difference. Um, but note that this is basically the same thing as saying one model will control for all the x's. Um, we're just substituting all the x's for, or for all the x's, we're substituting the propensity score. And again, this is most useful when you've got small samples, and so you need, you can't fit all the x's into your model of interest. But you want to still control for stuff, so you control for the propensity score, which is a single variable, rather than the 40 or something variables that you had in your uh, in your propensity score model. Um, you can do the same thing <coughs> with the propensity stratification, and you can say, okay, let me control for the stratification, like the quintile by itself. So where C is, is a coefficients treatment, controlling for the quintile stratification. You can interact the quintile. <laughs> Of stratification with the treatment effect to get the estimates of, you know, the, the effectiveness within each um, uh, within each quintile, uh, and as this is regression. You can do whatever you want. So you can also add covariates to this model, really that prevents you from over controlling for stuff. In a sense, there's no such thing really as over control. If you've got unbiased, <coughs> or sorry, unbalanced covariates in your x vector, you can stick them in this model, and you're controlling for them explicitly. Or, to go back to the previous question, if you're interested in something that, you know, in some, like we only have a single treatment here, there may be other factors that matter. If they matter purely, then you don't want to put them in the, if you're interested in their 
unique, independent, full contribution to the outcome, you probably don't want to put a propensity score because you're already controlling for them in that sense. But then you can just stick them out here in the regression by itself. So propensity score might be the place to put all those nuisance covariates that matter in terms of you know, potentially biasing your estimates because not controlling for them will result in no good variables, but that you don't care about their particular relationships with the outcome. But if you take it out, the unbalanced covariate, you, I mean, if you add it into your model as a separate, then you definitely have to take it out of your program. No, you don't have to. You could just leave it in. Right. If, it, like, if, it's, if it's age, right? And age, well, God damn, I can't balance age in this propensity score. I'm just going to put, I'm going to leave it in the propensity score, and I'm going to stick in age in the regression. And maybe I'll stick it in as a quadratic, or maybe I'll chop it up into covariates, or whatever. But, what you won't be able to tell me at the end of this is that I didn't control for age. <laughs> Why would you keep it in your program right. unbalanced? It doesn't hurt anything. I mean, it's like, how lazy are you? I don't know. It depends how long. It's like, you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter. It should be anything if it's unbalanced. Well, it may be better balanced. I mean, balanced is kind of a... Because what if it's like unbalanced in one, but balanced in like the rest of your sample? I, it doesn't it, make a it's difference. It's like, is two band-aids really going to be that much worse than one band-aid? Like, you can, you have a bigger band-aid, do you take off the first band-aid and stick on the whole band-aid, or do you just leave it on because you're lazy and stick? I mean, yeah. I, I don't well, know. I don't know statistics, those begin to change it. Oh, no, no, I, I mean, like, again, because we don't, like, th this is all in a situation where we're saying we don't actually care what the association, we don't care what the relationship is between age and outcomes. We just want to make sure we control for it. If you start telling me all of a sudden you care about that association, then I'm going to say don't monkey around with propensity scores. You need to be able to you need to stick this into a into a modeling context, into a regression model classification, where you can look at the effect as measured by the coefficient and then think carefully about how you're going to specify that. So it's like the first question is sort of do you care about this regret, this covariant, or is it just a pain in your butt in terms of threats to influence? Can you just ask a broader picture question? So broader you bigger. take all your cases or whatever, you take all your um, cohort, and you use that to come up with a model for your propensity score. And then you use that to reduce your sample size because you're, you're matching based on? You can't, but these are, these are some partial them. substitutes. I mean, these okay. are, you can, you can match, which will probably reduce your sample size somewhat, okay. and just do bivariate comparisons. Okay. You can, but you can oh, do a regression on that. You could match and then do a regression. Okay. You could not match and do a regression. Okay, so you can. So I guess what I'm trying to understand is like, why is this different? If you use the full sample to come up with a propensity score via regression, and then you use that same sample and do a regression with the propensity score, like. What's the difference? Like, it just seems like that's a condensed term of all the other regressors. So, like, why would you do it? I guess I don't understand that. Do do the propensity score business? Yeah, like, if that's just a condensed version of all those independent regressors. So, it turns out, if you just control for the linear pro propensity score in this particular example, or you control for all the independent variables, you get the same damn estimate in this particular case. Okay. I would say it wasn't worth it. Okay. <laughs> to say like, okay, this these arms are completely unbalanced. I have way more people who got treated that had an 80% likelihood than who didn't get treated. And you use that to match, like pick, use that to condense your sample, then you may get different estimates between, yeah, okay. So and that would really be the rationale of doing it above and beyond just using the same sample. Um, the same. So, uh, Again, so there's the there's a small sample case where you don't have room to put in all your x's, and you need to you only have room to put in a propensity score. But how would you get the propensity score? You're now? still using the same data, but again, we don't care we care less about the ability of the propensity score. We care less about the statistical stability of the propensity score regression itself, oh, okay. logistic equation. So we're we're saying let's summarize it as much as we can with the data we have, and take that summary measure and stick it in because we cannot fit all 40 covariates in our 100 sample, 100 observation model. That's the, okay. that's the like, don't look too closely. I'm using presence scores. It may be sucky, but I'm still using presence scores, so it's better. Like, I'm not telling you, it's a little bit of like, don't look over here kind of thing. I'm gonna hide, because you know I couldn't control for all 40, but I'm gonna do a score, right? So that's cool. I'm not gonna 
tell you that. In fact, 39 of them were able to spell out of the model because they were all collinear. <laughs> so I mean, we don't care about, like, that's not the goal. The goal for resident scores. And if you remember to ask if I check for balance, and oh yeah, of course they're balanced. It's fine. Um, you know, like, with 10 observations, you just can't do anything anyway. Like, you don't have, like, you got to have some sample to be able to work with this. And Professor score may help you get around some of this in a small sample case, but it's not, it's not super, like, it's only as good as the data and variables that you have. If you've got a million observations, and you're telling me, like, that I think the value of Prentice score, like, if you like, oh, if you told me I have a million observations and I ran the Prentice score and I stuck it in the model and I controlled for it, because I was, but I, you know, like, you're going to get the same thing. So it's like, that, be on the lookout for mumbo jumbo, right? Like, ooh. That's the whole, like, I think there's a general, not a, not a general, but I think there are, there's a segment of the researcher population that doesn't understand that propensity scores are controlling for the same things that you could stick into a regression. So there are very substitute in that, in that sense. And so just saying like, but I did a propensity score, like, but I did a regression. But we got the same thing. Oh, isn't that amazing? Like, that's what you're gonna get. If you start doing stuff like matching, uh, or stratification and looking at heterogeneous treatment effects, then you're, you're leveraging some of the, the information in so the... So like if you had a million patients and you had unbalanced arms between who got treatment and who didn't, and you ran a regression, there's a, without doing this, there's the risk that it would inappropriately weight these variables because they're so unbalanced, so that's why you would do this? Or what, what, I guess, so in that case, what? Um, so, okay, let's go back to here. Then I'm going to come back to this story. Right. If you've got a million observations and they're like, and for like, you do the presence score and they're symmetric with each other, that's probably going to suggest that there's not going to be a lot, like, let's say they were perfectly symmetric, which of course will never happen, but they're perfectly symmetric. That, I think that would suggest that the results from your regression, the results from your presence score are going to be identical, even with matching, because everyone's already well matched along that sense. It's when you start shaving off, giving the haircut to the sample, you're saying, like, there's, there's no guarantee that your estimates will change because you did matching. But what you can say with matching that you can't say prior to matching is that you know, by virtue of doing the match, that you've got a closer that the, the controls are a better representation of the counterfactual based on observables, at least, mm -hmm. than what you were getting with regression analysis. Will it matter? Depends sort of on the on the on the estimates. Doesn't do anything about unobserved heterogeneity or endogeneity or omitted variables bias. Um, and what you're losing potentially is depending on the story you're matching. Maybe losing like if you have a million patients and you have and then you have two hundred thousand at the end of it. Okay, so you've got a more robust estimate in terms of omitted, in terms of balance, but you're using one fifth of the sample. And so it's not it's not entirely free in that regard. The, the, the more you're throwing out, the more difference you expect there to be the more sample you're throwing out, the more difference you expect there to be between a sort of a unmatched and a matched analysis because you're saying after matching we're only getting the best matches of these two hundred thousand. But if the results are different, you can't be sure entirely whether it's because you've got a better match or be, and or because you're throwing out information. So throwing out information is not, like, not something we seek to do. So the, you know, it's, not, it's not entirely free, I guess, um, in that regard. So on the slide where you show the beta or coefficients are the same, what are your p values like? Well, they were all significant. I have like 700,000 observations. So. You know, but is the first one more significant? Not in a way that would matter. I mean, the t is like 90 and 80 or something. Because Maybe. your n is like so big. And this no, no, I didn't do any matching here. This is simply this is simply a regression control. I mean, I'm saying like these are the same sample size. Same, everything is the same except here I control the frequency score. Here I control for independent the, the vector of variables that's in the frequency score. And here I control for the quintile, the categories of quintiles. So the category of quintiles is a little bit different, but I mean I wouldn't. Probably not statistically different, or if it is, I wouldn't. I wouldn't look at it and be like, "Oh, you got to use quintiles because it's more accurate." Like, I don't, what I'm saying is that these. Th I mean, the, the method I wanted to say here is right, like the first and the third one. And the second one too is pretty damn close. Because I mean, just the point is that we're controlled. Just because you can present score doesn't mean you're going to get a different answer. Fundamentally, underlying the propensity score is whatever you put into the propensity score. That is what you're controlling for. 
And so if you control for it or you put a propensity score, you get this. You don't automatically get the same thing, but in this case you do. I would think you'd expect them to be close to each other. So I don't think the conclusion is don't use propensity scores, but I think it's like, I think the conclusion is like, just because someone says they use a propensity score doesn't automatically like endow their research with some magical properties like, oh, well, you know, I use regression too. Like, okay, so <laughs> it's a force. It's a tool. Use it for good and not evil. But, and maybe occasionally use it for obfuscation, but only if you're <laughs> No, with the limitations of it. So there's another approach. There's another, so there's the only reason you oh. do a propensity score then is this ability to match. No, no, no. no. No, right? I mean, like, again, small samples, you want to get balance. Matching is useful. Quintiles is useful. Or stratification can be useful as well. Gives you the, the opportunity to look for heterogeneous treatment effects. And then there's the fourth way, which is weighting, which is not something that I have a lot of knowledge about at all. But the idea here is that you can use the presence score to reweight the control group to make it look more like the counterfactual of the treatment group. And there's a, there's a strain of research in epidemiology and biostats now called doubly robust estimators, which are by both propensity score weighted and control, uh, you know, so we're waiting to make the distribution look more similar. So basically the idea here, I think is, as I understand it, is like we're basically trying to say, so this, this is the distribution of uh, the treatment group. It's got a mean somewhere, say, around here, right? By waiting for the, the, this particular formula, there's a variety of formulas that you can use for different things. So I don't want to say it's like one magical formula, but it's the formula that is common one is propensity score divided by one minus propensity score. will basically shift this, this distribution so it won't, look, it won't be automatically symmetric, but at least have the same mean. As, so basically, like downweighting the far away ones and upweighting the close ones to make it so that this control looks more like the truth. And that, again, is like part of the goal, right? That we're trying to get balance. So we can pick them out one by one, or we can shift the whole distribution in a way to emphasize those guys that are closer to the, to the mean. Um, so, yeah, so I just said that. Um, and then you can, you can, you can count this propensity score and then use, so like propensity score I call the p hat here, p hat divided by one minus p hat for the, you wait, the control subjects by that, you don't weight the treatment subjects any differently, then you can use a regression incorporating those weights, and you get that's a way to control. So that's that's a way to make the treatment the control group look more like the treatment group by shifting the distribution to make it look more similar. Is there a number of subjects where you kind of wouldn't want to use it? Or like people would say, like, what if you had like a sample of ten and like you did weighting or something? I mean, oh, weighting in particular? Yeah, because I'm just trying to think of like there may be a sample that's so small that it, I mean it just would be unrealistic to sort of do that and then present it to people as like, oh yeah. Well, I think ten is kind of a number where like outside of. Yeah, well, like, uh, ten, so ten like, was a little bit of a like a low ball example, but I'm just trying to think like realistically, is there like a sample size where you'd be like, weighting might not be like. Well, I don't think it might not be an analysis to do because it would just be an unrealistic like presentation of the data. I don't, so I don't, I don't know that anything that I would say about weighting, I don't think anything about sample size would apply just to weighting and not to right, not covariate to controls yeah. in general. Yeah. So like, I'm not proud to say I use propensity scores to do some work with this minimally invasive surgery stuff. And one of the, you know, we had a bunch of different uh, in seven different clinical settings, and but in one of the cases we had some, I think it was an aortic valve replacement or some aneurysm repair. That's what it was. And it was like we just didn't have a lot of cases because we were un, we were uh, the non-Medicare population. So you, I think we had something like 80 cases of treated, treated. We had plenty of non-treated, so our control group, and we used the score. So like we went up with a sample of it was like 200 or something. I'm not. Like, I don't want to say like the magic number is right. No, I'm just trying to. Just like be aware of what you're doing and um, at least know when you're like the general guidance is have some understanding of what's going on so that you have some also some understanding of when you're crossing lines or when you're getting into trouble. Um, but I mean, there's a an empirical kind of version of this, which is like, well, if you've got enough, if you have a sample to detect a significant difference. 
then the power is not an issue because you can have a significant difference. Like, if you don't have power, power, not having a power is primarily an issue when you don't find significant difference, right? Because then you don't know whether to reject a null because you don't have the power or because really the true relationship is, uh, is a null relationship. But if you run it and it's significantly different, you're out of the problem, you're out of the power problem, force problem. Like, took care of that problem, it's significant. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you very much for your audience. Yeah, that's not the dark arts, but I mean, be careful out there. Um, all right, so wow, I sort of killed this class. Um, uh, so a couple of quick. So does everyone know how to how to add user written programs to Stata? Let me see if I can actually show you real quick, because this might actually be mildly useful. Uh, or actually really useful if you want to do it, but only if you can minimize. <laughs> there we go, I'm the wrong button. Uh, I believe, so. is there any? Oh, Okay, 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 okay. So if you go to help, they want to watch that? If you go to help and then it's SJ and user written programs, SJ is not St. Joseph's, it's the State of Journal. Um, you click on that, you have this option to do, it says new packages, and then search. And it'll search the interwebs. And so like, I want to add PS Match, which is one of the programs that I just listed for you. So it goes out there and says, oh look, I found two programs relevant for PS Match. So PS Match 2 is the name of it. It's a module to perform full Mahalanobis Mah Versus score matching. <laughs> um, that, actually, that guy, he shows up a lot. The Mahalo Lewis dude. And it's really disappointing that he didn't know what he was going to say. I went through both of the comments like Mahalo Anyway, um, so you just click on it, and it gives you some information about it. Blah, 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 blah. And then it says click here to install. And now it just installed it. And so now I can go, and you know how this works, because I can go here and I can type help PS match 2, oh, that spaces. PS match 2, right? And it tells me that there's some stuff there and gives me some information about how to use it. And and so that's I think one of the that's one of the great things about Stata is that it's a piece of cake. There's a whole community of stuff out there. So if you're like, ah, I wonder how to do this, like, this, like I need some crazy estimator, you just do, go to Google and search something like propensity score stata, and you can find some stuff, and you can go add it to your stata, and then you can use it. And the bad thing is you don't know if it's right, but <laughs> generally speaking, like, if it's on stata, like, it's good enough for me, so. Um, but if it comes from the state of journal, you can be like... If it's not a state of journal, you're fine. But if it's like some schmo is like, you know, like, all right, just did a new file. You should use it. Like, all right, fine. But then again, it goes back to the don't ask questions, you don't want to know the answer to, right? I mean, I, I did it. I did it. I got a result. And, and uh, yeah. So that's, I'm sorry. Oh, um, like uh, maybe PDFs or data files. They don't, they're not essential to running the program, but they may, you know, help you understand it. Some way. So, um, we're almost out of time, so I'm not gonna. Oh, yeah, so I'm just gonna summarize. This is actually a great place to stop. Because next week, we'll, next week, the difference and differences two, we'll start talking about difference and differences one. Um, <laughs> which is good for me, because I have more questions prep. Um, so, so far, all we've talked about, not all we've talked about, but in the context of, of regression and propensity and blah, blah, blah. The theme has been controlling for covariance. We have this concern about. Um, lack of balance in our sample. To, to get the causality with the cross-sectional regression, we're talk, or cross-sectional data, we're talking about invoking the um, conditional independence assumption, which basically just says that conditional on X, the difference in the outcomes for the treated and the untreated group are an estimate of the causal association. So the outcomes, you know, didn't get DES length of stay, didn't get DES length of stay, after conditioning on X, if we condition on it, then treatment assignment is effectively random. If we're saying our results are causal, we're saying that is true. Conditioning on X, controlling for X, receipt of drug incentive is random. 
probably not true in any of the, the covariates that I've showed you. I'm not controlling for anything like coronary anatomy or blah, blah, blah clinical indicators. So those things could vary. But if it were the case, or if I want to think about that, I'd have to take conditional on it. How can we actually operationalize this conditional independence assumption or, or getting from this kind of expectation to actual data in our hands? We have three main approaches that we've talked about, and I think, I don't say this is all of them, this is all that I know about. One is simply regression. Two is matching on covariates, which we talked about last week. And three is this propensity score business in any version of its flavor of matching or stratifying or, bound or weighting or whatever. All three of them are really related to each other. They have some trade-offs, and generally, I think regression is still probably the most common because it's a nice, convenient framework. So it's a lingua franca, and people people speak it, and also because it gives you embeds in a lot of the statistical testing for you. It's an easy tool, but they all are limited to controlling for observable axes. So it doesn't do anything about the fact that if you if you have another factor z and it's correlated with the treatment and also with the outcome, sorry, your estimates are going to be biased or maybe biased because whether you use regression, covariate matching, or propensity score, whatever, because all we're doing is controlling for observables. Um, <clears throat> and both, all of them have to be conditional, have to depend on this variation um, in the treatment conditional on axis. That is, we have to be able to find these cases where people look the same except for the fact that they got, one of them got the treatment and one of them got the control. That's implicit in this whole approach. That's the same thing as saying conditional on X treatment is random. It's the same thing as saying, like, look, our counterfactual of the best representation of me who got the treatment is someone perfectly like me except that they didn't get the treatment. All those things are the same way of saying, well, depend on variation in the conditional on X. So, that's what we know so far. Tuesday, 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 we will start in on some longitudinal measures, methods, and specifically talking about difference and differences. Um, and we'll go forward from there. So thanks very much. Have a good weekend. Um, and make sure you use these tools responsibly. <laughs>